Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I don't know whether you can see this, but there's a red mat on here. Can, can you see this red mat thing here? And we've been told we have to stand here to make our presentations and that they've actually electrified the floor and that if you stand off it, <laughs> you get a shock, goes where it shouldn't. Um, but it made me think this is a bit like science, really, maybe like life as well, but certainly in science, that it's, you have this, this, where you, this mat, this red mat, where you can do your science and it's nice and comfortable and you, you do a, a little equation here or twiddle there and everybody's happy and the papers get published. And, but you don't really change anything at all. You're just doing what people tell you you're supposed to do. I mean... In science, it's bloody good when you go, yay, and do something a little bit different. M maybe you get it wrong sometimes, and maybe you do that, and you do get electrocuted, or you fall over, or something goes wrong. But it's really this sort of science that I want to talk about today. Um, is everybody happy being human? That's the right answer. There's a, a nobody here really happy because what I want to talk about is the possibility of actually doing something a bit better, saying, okay, it's all right being human, but uh, I could do a few more things. I could be a little bit more. And now I'm going to talk through... Um, this is where the technology... Press the button. Down is... There we go. I'm talking about experiments to change things a little bit. This is a younger version of me on the operating table with my GP, George Boulos, really nice guy. And what he's doing is implanting, uh, and now it's called a, a, a near field communicator, I, an identification device, radio frequency identification, which you can see. This, the, not on the left-hand side, that's not what was implanted. The thing on the right-hand side, this was implanted in my left arm. So I became the first human to have one of these. Now there's quite a few people with them. What it did for me, we linked it up to the computer in the building where I was working so that if I passed through a doorway, the computer knew it was me. So as I walked down the corridor, the lights came on for me. As I went to the door, to my laboratory, it opened automatically. You know, it was really cool stuff. As I came through the front door, it said, Hello, Professor Warwick, which I really like, because in, you know, the Sun newspaper, I know you don't read the Sun, but the Sun newspaper, the headlines in the Sun that day were, Hello, Mr. Chip which I thought was really nice. Um, quite, no, I don't know, nowadays though, this, is you, this same implant is used quite a bit. A lot of people are trying it out. But does anybody have an animal with a chip implanted? Thank you very much, thank you very much, Pam. It's great. And there's a few people there. I think for you guys, you can feel happy that the technology was fully tested on a human before your animal received it. Now, I, I, you, a lot of students here today, I guess, and what I want to show you is what some of my own students have been doing. Um, this is, I, I'm supposed to say, don't try this at home, but in a way, maybe you can. Um, you can see the guy here. He's actually a, a tattoo artist, which there's a bit of a problem with, and what he's doing is implanting magnets in the finger of one of my students, Jowish, and I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. But I, I have to, it's a bit of a problem, really. You may see the guy that's actually doing this implant, you see some tattoos on his arm. I don't know if you can see them there. And that is, he's not a medical guy, he is a tattoo artist. But if you go on his web page, he goes by the name of Dr. Evil. That, now, is, this is serious. He, this creates a bit of a problem because in the university you have to get ethical approval for doing, you know, particularly students having implants and things like that. And on the, the, there's a line on the forms which says who is carrying out the medical procedure. And we have to write there, Dr. Evil, uh, which doesn't go down too well. What he's doing, you can see, this is an x-ray of his fingers. You can see two, two in, it's his left hand. You can see the two magnets in his finger. And what we're doing, here's Jowish, um, he's got a baseball cap on with ultrasonic sensors. These are ultrasonic sensors. This is a sense, of course, 
those of you in the audience who are humans, you've probably not experienced ultrasonic senses, which is a great shame, really, because you're very limited in terms of sensory input. Well, Joash has experienced it to some extent. The ultrasonics give a good indication of distance, and as an object comes closer, the sensors pick that up, and what they're doing is transmitting a signal down to a little coil of wire that's wrapped around the finger, and in the finger is the magnet. So what happens, as an object comes closer, the, the current in the coil changes, which vibrates the magnet more. So as an object's closer, the magnet vibrates more. So the person can feel in the finger how far away objects are. Now, clearly, that's useful for uh, perhaps somebody who's blind, but of course, it, you know, generally, it's giving you an extra, an ultrasonic, a sense of distance, which humans don't have. Another one of my students, Ian Harrison, has been doing his PhD using the same thing, but with infrared. Now, infrared is like a heat signal. So what he can do is to scan around and say, you are hotter then, you, you know, he can detect the, I, just <laughs> te technically, I don't want to get in, lose my job here, uh, technically, you, you know, you can, who is a hotter body? He can detect by the, the vibrations in his finger. Uh, now, uh, what use is for that? In the military domain, maybe, going in, uh, before you go into a building, maybe there are some soldiers in the building, you don't know, so put your finger around the corner, uh -huh. oh yeah, there's somebody over there, and so on. But we don't know what some of the uses might be. Now, um, some of you may be thinking before too long you're going to die, uh, hopefully not too many of you, but when you do, wouldn't it be nice if there was the possibility of living on? Maybe not in your human body, which is, you know, there's all sorts of problems with it, but maybe with a technological body. Now, what we're doing here, this is um, looking at a robot rather than having a computer or microprocessor for a brain, it has a biological brain. So you see the, the physical side of the robot, little robot on wheels, maybe with ultrasonic sensors, but the brain of the robot we've replaced by a biological brain using neurons, real brain cells. And it says there, so these, these are grown on what's called a multi-electrode array. It's a little dish, essentially, with electrodes on the bottom of it. In fact, I've got a picture of it. Here we go. Here's, here's the dish with the gold electrodes. The black rings are there to stop it dehydrating. We have to keep it moist. So the brain cells, typically, they're taken from rat embryos, we separate them using enzymes, and then they're splurted into this little um, dish, and there they grow. So we have to keep this in an incubator at the right temperature, because it is living, we have to feed it, and after about 10 days, the neurons, the brain cells, will start linking up with each other. St I mean, straight away, when we put them in the dish, they start pushing out what look like tentacles, what become what are called dendrites and axons, when they, they link up with other neurons. But after 10 days, we've got quite a complex network there that we can send signals. These, these gold electrodes here, we can send signals into this, this little culture, the brain, that's growing there, and see where we get a, a signal out. Maybe if we send a signal here, there's a passageway through the brain, and it comes out on another electrode. We can pull around the different electrodes, see where we've got a passageway through the brain, and then use that subsequently. Typically, then we might have 150,000 brain cells in the little dish there, and what we do is link it to a robot body. So we give the brain a body which can then move around in a little arena and we can see how the brain learns, how the brain changes and try different things to modify it. Now as I said earlier that you may fancy yourself rather than having rat neurons, having some of neur your neurons. Some of you might want to donate some of your brain cells. As students you don't use them that much and put them in you know, instead of using rat brain cells, we'll take your brain cells and put them in our little dish, culture them, grow them, and then, you know, instead of being in your human body with all the problems you've got, you can be in a little robot body in instead, maybe walking around and so on. More recently, 
we're looking at, rather than operating in two dimensions, as we see there, having a three-dimensional lattice structure, which allows us to use not 150,000, but about 60 million brain cells. Okay, it's not up to the 100 billion of the human brain, but 60 million is still pretty good anyway. So it's 60 million human brain cells in a robot body is where we are now, which raises, to me anyway, all sorts of questions. You know, should it have rights? Because at the moment, at the end of the day, I can pick this robot up and throw it in the bin. And okay, the other researchers might grumble at me because that's two weeks' work if I'm thrown away. But nobody comes and takes me off to prison or, or kills me or anything like that. I can just do it. But should I be able to do it? Because if it was a cat or a, you know, someone's got a license for it, Some, somebody else might be annoyed. And if, if, you know, I can't do that, should this little robot with its 60 million human brain cells or 100 million human brain, should it have some rights at all? You know, should it be able to vote in elections? Uh, and, you know, will I be able to program it to vote for who I want it to vote? Uh, all sorts of nice questions. Maybe it's a good idea after all. Um, the final experiment I want to talk about is the main one that I've been involved with. Um, and this is, you know, if you fancy it, go, in, go for it. This is me on the operating theatre at the Radcliffe uh, Hospital down in Oxford. And in fact, the, one of the surgeons that were involved with this experiment, there were four of them all together, Amjad Shad, that we can see on the left-hand side, he's now a visiting professor at the university, and he's a neurosurgeon down at the University Hospital, uh, Coventry in Warwickshire. So he's still, still all together working on the, the project. The, uh, what I had was another implant, which I will describe. It was a two-hour neurosurgical operation to put that in place. This is the implant. It's uh, called the Utah Array because that's where it comes from, that's Utah, not a ray, and it, it's also called the brain gate. Um, the reason it's called the brain gate is that we were in competition with people from America, and we got there first, of course, we, UK, we got there before the Americans, and then, so they changed the name of it, so they could be the first when they re renamed it. So you have to, they're crafty, these Americans, even if, even if they're stuck in snow at the moment, they're still crafty. So this was implanted, I don't know whether you can see, there's a, a scar on my arm there. This was implanted for scientific purposes. So I didn't have a, a medical issue, it was for a scientific project. And the surgeons, including Amjad, opened up my arm there and fired this little implant of 100 electrodes into the nervous system in my left arm. They had to cut away the myelin sheath uh, around the, the nerve fibers and then hammered the thing in with a little impactor. In fact, um, I don't know if I've told this to anyone before, but in the operation that I had, uh, it got it all lined up. Like I'd been on the operating table for two hours. They opened up my nervous system, got everything in place. This little impactor is just a little mini pneumatic hammer to hammer this thing in as quickly as possible. And uh, they, the surgeon said, right, charge the unit up. Charge the unit up. And he pressed the button, and it sort of went, Bleh. And mm, nothing's happened. Not. Now, this, is, this was about six or seven years' research, and on the operating table, they've opened up the nervous system, and all they've got to do is hammer this thing into my nervous system, and it's going, Bleh. So he said, OK, let's do it again. Charge it up. Choo -choo 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 -choo, charge the unit up. Press the button. It went. So they had no idea something was going wrong. So I thought, oh, it's a, no, 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 we're just, that was it. Six years' work, no, let's sew me up and let's go away, and that's that. What it turned out was the guy that had put the connections together, in, where it said in, he'd pushed out, and where it was out, he'd pushed in. So the tubes were round the wrong way. So what it was doing was going, boom, <coughs> when it was coming away, and then, President studying it, he went, Hur. whereas it should have been going, hung, if you see what I mean, it was the wrong way around. <laughs> so it was sucking when it should have been blowing and blowing when it was. Uh, so they connected it around the other way. So in front of there, okay, charged it up, pressed the button, whang, and in it went, and that was it. 
Um, and it was, of course, it was all anesthetized. So, but all I, all I actually had um, that night, I think my wife's here, so she can tell me if I'm wrong, um, was just one neurofen painkiller, because we didn't know. No, no one had had this before, this particular implant at all. I think it had been fired into sciatic nerves of chickens before, that was it. Um, so we didn't know, would it be painful next day? This is, because it's not every day you start blasting things into your nervous system. Um, and it, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it was fine. And for uh, just over three months, we carried out the experiments, and I will describe with some holiday snaps the experiments which we did. One of them, which I've talked about before, was really looking at how poor humans are in terms of sensory input. We sense, would you believe this, about 5% of what's going on around us. We have no idea. 95% of what's happening around us, we have no idea about because we just don't sense it. Our vision is all right. You know, it's like when you get older, it, it's not so good. But your vision's all right, your, your sound is not particularly good, and so on. But the other 95%, all the infrared, ultraviolet, x-rays, we're just blasé, we miss it, miss it out altogether, no idea. So this is looking, ultrasonic signals on the baseball cap, down into my nervous system, so my brain learnt to recognize the pulses. As the electric pulses came into my brain, ding, 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 more pulses meant something is close. Pulses died down, something is not so close. So with a blindfold on, I was able to detect objects and pretty accurately how far they were away. Not in the sense of, oh, that's 2.34 meters, not that sort of thing, but in terms of detecting an object, and then if there's a slight movement, one way or the other, can detect that with very high accuracy. This is my wife, who's here. She, she hasn't changed, and I have, but there we go. Um, she had some jewelry that a student at the Royal College of Art... There's nobody here from the Royal College of Art. No, okay. Anybody here from the arts world? Or anybody, can anybody hear me out there? <laughs> Any, th so this was a, a project for a PhD student at the Royal College of Art. You see the jewellery, which it changes colour from blue to red. And we linked it up to my nervous system. So essentially, my nervous system was controlling my wife's jewellery. So when I was calm and relaxed, her jewellery was blue, like you see it there. And when my, I, you know, I got a bit excited, then the, her jewellery started flashing red. Now, she, she doesn't work in the university. She works in an office. If you can imagine, set the scene, there she is in her office with the jewellery linked to my nervous system. Jewellery is blue. Okay, he's not doing anything he shouldn't. And then the jewellery <laughs> starts flashing red. What is he doing? And more importantly, who is he doing it with? <laughs> so I don't know whether that was a good idea. Um, this was taken at Columbia University in New York City. And what we did there was to link my nervous system directly into the internet. We literally plugged... I actually had an... I, my nervous system had an IP address which you, if you'd have known what it was, you could have sent signals directly into my nervous system. The security mainly on it was that we didn't tell people what we were doing beforehand. So nobody knew the number or anything like that. But what we did was to link up um, from my nervous system in New York to a robot hand in the UK, which at Reading, where I was at the time. So literally, I moved my hand in New York and my neural signals, my brain signals, we picked up from... It's like listening into a telephone call. If you work for BT, you do that sort of thing. Listening to, so it was listening into my nervous system and send those signals across the internet and out to the robot hand in the UK. So I moved my hand in New York, in New York which also moved this robot hand in the UK, the same brain signals. Uh, not only that, but as the robot hand gripped an object, signals were sent back from the fingertips in the robot hand across the internet to stimulate my nervous system in New York. So I could feel how much force the hand was applying on a different continent. So this means if you want to stay as an ordinary human, fine. I certainly don't. But what you can have 
is to extend your nervous system across the internet and your body and your brain don't have to be in the same place. Your brain can be in one place, your body can be all over the... It can be on different planets, if you want, as long as you have network connections, can be by satellite and so on. That's not science fiction, that's the technology we have now. So, you know, don't stay on the red mat, actually try things out. The final part, which for me was the most exciting, my wife also had electrodes pushed into her nervous system with no anaesthetic at all. And what we did was in the lab link our two nervous systems together so that when she closed her hand, my brain received an electric pulse. And when she went ding, 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 so ding, ding, ding. So essentially, we were communicating nervous system to nervous system electrically for the first time in the world, which clearly, if we look ahead, will be not just nervous system to nervous system, but will be brain to brain, will be thinking to each other. The form of communication that we're using now, which is so antiquated, such as speaking to each other, is so antiquated, be unbelievable, technology doesn't do that, why should we? We will be communicating by thought communication in the future. Now I have to say, just to conclude, my wife doesn't fancy the next step, which is clearly a brain implant uh, in order to communicate brain to brain, that small thing that you have to have, which well, I'm, I'm all for it though. So if there's anybody there that fancies having a brain implant in order to join me by thought, uh, then I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much.